Um, I'm Kaylin. I'm assistant professor in genetics, and um, I'm really excited today to host Jeremy Nance um, for the seminar speaker this week. Jeremy got his PhD in molecular and cell biology from the University of Arizona, where he worked on sperm activation in C. elegans. And then following his PhD, he went on to do a postdoc in John Priest's lab at uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, where he was an American Cancer Society postdoc. Um, and then in 2004, Jeremy started his own lab at the Skirball and the Department of Cell Bio at NYU, um, where he has been since. And he now also is the vice chair of research for his department. Jeremy has received multiple awards, including being honored as an NYU Whitehead Fellow, the Mallinckrodt Foundation Fellowship, and an Irma T. Herschel Scholar. And more recently, Jeremy was honored at the American Cell Society for Cell Biology as the LGBTQ plus keynote awardee. Over the course of Jeremy's faculty position, he's trained almost 20 scientists um, and his lab has focuses on, focused on understanding molecular mechanisms of morphogenesis, particularly using C. elegans as a model. And Jeremy has contributed significantly to our understanding of cell polarity establishment during embryogenesis, how epithelial tissues are formed and organized and how niche interactions regulate cell function and behavior. I'm really excited um, to hear Jeremy share his work today and um, please welcome, join me in welcoming him. All right, thank you so much. I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am because I haven't given an in-person seminar in, aside from a meeting in quite some time. And so, and I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces in the audience here. Um, and two small world coincidences before I get started. So, uh, Kaylin didn't say, but her niece is actually, I'm sorry, her cousin is actually a grad student in my lab. I, that was news to me. And um, my brother-in-law is actually here. He's a, he does grants management um, for uni uh, Yale University. So if you get a strange question about how the research was funded at the end, it was probably from him. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to stop me. I understand that someone's moderating the chat too. So if you want to interrupt with those questions, that's fine. Um, advancing, how do I do that? Do you know how to advance the slides, sir? I can't do it from my computer, it looks like. Oh, just do it the old fashioned way. Okay. So broadly speaking, my lab is interested in the question of how organs come together, which is, is funny because Daniel and I were just talking about this a very similar problem um, in worms. And this is a really complex uh, issue, kind of illustrated most by the human brain, where you have 80 billion neurons that have to come together in a meaningful way so that um, we can talk and listen to talks and do all kinds of things. And so my lab has taken a, a really reductionist approach to this problem to try to understand how individual cell-cell interactions uh, can contribute to formation of organs and uh, during development. And one of the most um, important interactions uh, that happens during development and also homeostasis is that between stem cells and their niche, uh, which are the cells that guide stem cell behaviors um, for example, uh, proliferation, quiescence, asymmetric division versus symmetric division. So this really sets the size of organs, helps in repair, and determines the composition of organs. And we've been studying this problem in C. elegans in a, pretty, a very simplified system to understand how individual cell interactions really guide uh, formation of one of the most important uh, organs in the animal, and that is the gonad. So this is about as simple as you can get uh, in thinking about an organ. So there are four cells. Um, there are two somatic gonad cells, which function as niche cells, and I'll talk about these first. And there are two primordial germ cells in magenta, which make the entire germline of the animal. So, and this actually, this little four-celled organ is, remains quiescent during embryogenesis uh, until the animal hatches. And if there's food around, the whole organ uh, begins to differentiate and proliferate in tandem and populates about half of the mass of the adult. So uh, these, these uh, four little cells are quite important. And so um, I want you to remember, and this is important for, for uh, what I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, that the primordial germ cells are quiescent during embryogenesis. They're actually arrested in the G2 phase of the cell cycle, which is a bit unusual, and they stay that way until hatching. So they don't divide ever uh, during the embryo under normal situations. Okay, so over the years, uh, we've been studying this little four-cell primordium, and it has a lot of really interesting secrets to tell us. 
and some very cool cell biology um, that we've been that we've been trying to un, uh, understand. So it starts off as two individual groups of cells. So the somatic gonad cells, um, which are the the yellow cells, are actually born in the anterior, and they migrate along a third tissue type, which I'm going to introduce and talk a lot about in the second part of the talk, which is the endoderm, which is in blue. And they migrate along the endoderm until they reach the primordial germ cells, and then as soon as they find them they extend these long processes and they begin to wrap around them. And this is actually a common feature of, in many stem cell systems and particularly uh, those in the germline. You often see very elaborate interactions between um, somatic cells in the gonad and germline cells and, and niche cells in particular. So then the embryo turns on its side. So you're only looking at one of the two primordial germ cells here. They make these strange lobe-like structures, which I'm going to talk about in the second part of my talk. Um, and then at the same time, a basal membrane appears, and then those lobes disappear and appear inside the endoderm. So just keep that, uh, keep that in mind, and we'll, we'll come to that uh, in the second half. Okay, so this is what those cells actually look like. Uh, you're looking at a primordial germ cell in magenta. These are the lobes that it's making sticking up inside the endoderm in cyan and this uh, somatic gonad cell wrapping around the cell body of the primordial germ cell. So looking at a bit higher magnification, I lifted this from John Solston's lineage paper of C. elegans embryogenesis. And you can see that there's no surface of the primordial germ cell that is not covered by another cell. So the cell body, uh, which is down here, here's the nucleus, is wrapped by one of these somatic gonad precursors. And the lobes, which are extending up here into the intestine or the endoderm, are being wrapped by those cells. Okay, so the first part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about the work of postdoc Dan McIntyre, who, who's about to leave in two weeks to start his own lab at the University of Virginia. And his question was, why did the somatic gonad cells wrap around the primordial germ cells? What is the biological significance of that? And again, it's a behavior that's seen in many different um, stem cell niche interactions, particularly in the germline. So this was, we studied this problem just from a descriptive angle almost 10 years ago using live imaging. And you can see that as soon as, this is a still frame from a movie, as soon as the somatic gonad cells in yellow reach the germ cells, they put out these thin membrane sheets that vary within a few minutes, completely engulf their surfaces. And then um, they, they cover those surfaces entirely and stay that way. So what Dan noticed is that this behavior, this wrapping behavior was happening at about the same time that a basal membrane first appeared around the gonad primordium, and that's denoted in these, um, these dashed lines around the outside of the somatic gonad cells. Here's what this looks like in a newly hatched animal. So in this animal, the, the SGPs are labeled now in magenta, and the basin membrane uh, is labeled in green, and you can see that it sits on the surface of those, those cells, and the germ cells are tucked away in this, these two pockets right here in the middle. So there's no basin membrane in this, inside of this organ, it's surrounding the outside of it. So he saw this and wondered if maybe the one role of the wrapping was for the SGPs to um, nucleate or uh, 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 deposit this gonadal basement membrane. And then um, a bigger question was, what is it doing? Is it just important for organization of the gonad or does it have some more important role? Okay, so let me introduce you to a few basement membrane uh, components and their receptors that are common across all animals. Um, Cells express various basic membrane receptors. Two I'm going to talk about today are the integrins and dystroglycan. So these span the plasma membrane. One is a heterodimer, and another in C. elegans is a single gene product. Um, they interact with a foundational basic membrane protein called laminin, uh, which I'll talk about next. And laminin, in turn, can recruit other core basic membrane proteins. And the three additional ones that are found in all basic membranes are collagen, nitrogen, and perlocan. And we'll talk about uh, one of those in particular a little bit later. Um, in addition, other proteins are assembled on top of this basic membrane, and those can be tissue specific or appear at certain developmental stages. Okay, so uh, based on this model, if you get rid of laminin, you really uh, deplete the entire basic membrane, or at least an assembled basic membrane. And so uh, C. elegans uh, is really um, uniquely positioned genetically to study this problem because. Unlike in mammals, where there are numerous different genes that encode laminin subunits, 
you can get rid of the entire um, basement membrane by a mutation of one, uh, one gene. So laminin is a heterotrimer composed of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. And the beta and the gamma subunits are encoded by single genes, LAM1 and LAM2. So genetically, you can just perturb the entire basement membrane by um, deleting either one of those genes. And so Dan took a look at um, LAM1. And here it is. Um, so in this image, the primordial germ cell nucleus is labeled. And you can see this basement membrane now around that cell. And also there's basement membrane between other uh, cell types. So th these are between different layers in the body. And to address whether or not the SGPs were important for nucleating this membrane, he took a laser and killed those cells before they could migrate to the primordial germ cells and asked what this basement membrane looked like. And you can see that you're very specifically missing the gonadal basement membrane, which would be here. And then you, you preserve the basement membrane between the other cell types. So the germ cells, the interpretation of this experiment is that the primordial germ cells lack the ability to nucleate a basement membrane on their own, and that the somatic gonad cells wrapping around them templates this basement membrane, which sits around the organ. Okay, what is that basement membrane doing? We thought for sure it must be important for the structure of the organ, because that is one known role for basement membrane components. And sure enough, it was. So uh, again, remember, you can take out the unique laminin beta or gamma, which are encoded by LAM1 and LAM2. And you can see that in, in these conditions, all four cells are still present. But instead of forming this nice linear array with somatic gonad cells on the outside and germ cells in the middle, it's very disorganized. And this was true uh, for both LAM1 and LAM2. So that wasn't so surprising. Um, we wanted to know whether this phenotype was specific to taking away that gonadal basement membrane. And for these experiments, um, Dan took advantage of the fact that there are two different laminin alphas, and only one of them is found in the gonad, and most other basement membranes contain both of those, um, those components. So if he specifically takes away uh, the, the gonadal laminin alpha, which is epi one he gets exactly the same phenotype I just showed you. And when he takes out the non-gonadal uh, laminar and alpha, there's no defect in the gonad itself. And that, and those were very penetrant phenotypes. Okay, so this isn't so surprising. The basement membrane is nucleated by the somatic gonad cells. It keeps this organ intact. Um, he wondered, in addition, whether there was, once the basement membrane was nucleated, if they had to hold on to it to keep this, this wrapping in place. And to address that question, he took a look at receptors which were present on the surface of the somatic gonad cells. And the one I'm going to tell you about now is called dystroglycan. It's encoded by a single gene in C. elegans called DGN1. And interestingly, this protein is found um, only, it's found on the SGP surfaces, but only on the surface which faces out, that's touching the uh, basement membrane and not uh, where the uh, germ cell is, which would be on this interior membrane. And just like the case where he took away a laminin, he saw that the organ initially developed correctly and then it fell apart. You also saw the, the same phenotype um, as you did with laminin depletion. So the somatic gonad cells nucleating the membrane, they express this adhesion protein which binds to the membrane that they nucleate and that keeps this wrapping membrane in place. But along the, along the way, Dan made a, what was a much more surprising discovery and that is um, that I remember I told you that the primordial germ cells were arrested in development and stayed in G2 phase until hatching. And he saw that uh, in many cases, there were more than two primordial germ cells when he took away the basement membrane. Um, and, in, and that was uh, incompletely penetrant phenotype. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but he saw it in all the cases where he destroyed the gonadal basement membrane. Um, and this actually happens not due to a developmental defect in the number of initial uh, primordial germ cells, but through an exit and a division of those cells. So he showed this by live imaging. You can see these stills from a time lapse that this primordial germ cell, when he takes away laminin, is beginning to divide. And now he has extra primordial germ cells. Again, this absolutely never happens in a normal embryo under any condition that, that we have seen. So what's happening to those cells? Uh, we knew a lot at the time about how the proliferation of germline stem cells in the larva was maintained and promoted, and that was through the notch signaling pathway. So germline stem cells uh, in the larval gonad express a notch receptor, uh, which sees a notch ligand in a different niche cell called the distal tip cell, and that um, causes cells to proliferate and stay mitotic and not enter meiosis. 
And one of the downstream targets of Notch uh, in that in, during the larva is a gene called SIGL1. And there was no known role for Notch in the embryo in primordial germ cells, but we took a look at a reporter for SIGL1 activity, it's just a transcriptional reporter, to see if maybe these cells were inappropriately turning on the Notch pathway in the embryo when they normally should never do so. And that was what he saw. So um, you can see a SIGL1 GFP reporter coming up when he depletes laminin or the gonadal basement membrane protein epi-1. And that's quantified here on the right. So finally, is that responsible for the phenotype? And he tested this by using two different temperature sensitive alleles of the, um, the notch receptor, which is called GLP-1, one of the two in worms. And this is the one expressed in germ cells. And he can suppress this um, proliferation phenotype by lowering the activity of GLP-1, particularly during this stage of development. Okay, so, so far what I've told you is we have basement membrane is somehow in a normal animal keeping notch from coming on in the primordial germ cells and notch would normally be promoting those cells to proliferate um, at, like they do in, in larval stages. So you, you, may be, uh, you may have noticed this, but one uh, fly in the ointment with this hypothesis, at least the way I've described it, is that the, um, the primordial germ cells don't touch the basement membrane, at least they don't appear to. Uh, we can't rule out that they make some small transient contact, but it's the somatic gonad cells that do. So somehow this inhibitory signal that keeps notch off has to travel through the somatic gonad cells to the germ cells in order to, to have an effect. And so Dan hypothesized that the somatic gonad cells were relaying that signal. And he tested this using the same approach I just described to you, but adding on a laser microsurgery. So in this experiment, he's looking at the notch activity reporter, the SIGL1 GFP, after taking away laminin. And in normal um, uh, embryos and in embryos where he's ablated the SGPs with a laser, so they're not there. And you can see that uh, when you lack laminin, you only turn on notch when you have SGPs and you don't turn on notch uh, when those cells are killed with the laser. So our interpretation of those experiments is that the basement membrane is inhibiting some signal in the somatic gonad cells, which is normally activating notch and turning on proliferation. We don't yet know what that signal is, but a logical uh, candidate would be a notch ligand, so a delta-like ligand. And there are numerous candidates that we're sorting through now to try to figure out what that might be. Okay, so following up on this, on this study, um, Dan wanted to know, well, what are the basement membrane receptors and components that might be involved in this signaling pathway, this inhibitory signaling pathway? And so he started off, I already told you about dystroglycan, which was involved in adhesion. And I forgot to mention this, um, but the dystroglycan mutants don't have proliferation defects. So their gonad is as, is as disrupted as the laminin um, depletion but they don't proliferate. So it's not that they're proliferating only because the gonad is disrupted. There's something more specific that's happening with laminin. And so he took a look um, at uh, integrin receptors, which are as, uh, also expressed on the surface of the, um, the SGP. So here's a low level of integrin on the surface of those cells to ask if they may be receiving this signal from the basement membrane. And the first thing he did was just knock them out and then ask, do the cells proliferate like they do with laminin? And there was no phenotype whatsoever. And so then he wondered, well, maybe the situation was a bit more complex. Maybe rather than laminin activating integrin by binding to it directly, laminin could be inhibiting some other component which is interacting with integrin. And if that were the case, then maybe taking away um, integrin would suppress the laminin phenotype. So before I get into those experiments, just because I'll be changing the numbers on you here in the graphs, um, he decided that if he wanted to look at a suppression assay, he needed a more robust phenotype. And so he simply took um, epi-1 animals, which make it to hatching and grow, and he kept them starved so that the primordial germ cells wouldn't have nutritional signals, uh, but they lack basement membrane because they don't have this laminin alpha. And I showed you this data earlier, maybe about 20 to 30% after the first day uh, have extra germ cells, and that number really jumps after day two. So uh, all, the, all the animals virtually have um, extra germ cells in both RNAi conditions and also a null mutant that we made. So he took the second day where 80% of the animals had extra germ cells and he asked, could he suppress that phenotype by taking away integrin? Um, I forgot to mention, so there are the genetics of integrin and C. elegans, again, is really simple. You have a single, this is an alpha beta subunit heterodimer 
uh, you have a single beta subunit. So you can take away all integrin function by taking away the gene PAT3. And there are two different genes which encode alpha subunits, PAT2 and INO1. Um, and so you can, by taking both of those out, you could also uh, remove all integrin function. So again, this is our assay. He asked if you um, treat animals with epi-1 RNAi to get rid of laminin and look two days later, what fraction of embryos have extra germ cells and taking away one of the two alphas or the beta completely, almost completely suppressed this proliferation phenotype. Whereas the other alpha had no phenotype, uh, no suppression phenotype. So the conclusion here is that um, integrin was somehow important in this in, in relaying the signal from the basement membrane to the SGPs. So he wanted to know if it was functioning in the somatic gonad cells. And this is a really important gene for lots of different aspects of development. And in order to do this, we do a lot of genetics at the protein level, uh, which we need to do in C. elegans because they develop very rapidly. And if you want to know the function of a gene in one cell, you so in some cases, you can't even remove it a few cell cycles earlier because it might have a, a different role there. And so um, our lab some years ago developed uh, a technique called ZF1 degradation, uh, which is kind of uh, adapted from a naturally occurring process in C. elegans. You can take a small zinc finger, append it to a protein, and you can conditionally express an adapter protein called ZIF1, and within about 30 or 45 minutes, that protein will disappear. So for those of you who, who might have heard of the auxin inducible system, this is the same logic. It doesn't involve auxin. Uh, and we have all kinds of problems with auxin dealing with embryos because of penetration of the eggshell. So this, is, this system works very well. And it gives very, very strong phenotypes uh, on short order. So to do this experiment, we tagged using CRISPR, we tagged the endogenous PAT3 allele with a ZF1 degron. And we have a very SGP specific promoter that we can use to express ZF1 just in those cells. And you can see we get exactly the same suppression phenotype of this proliferation when we take away uh, PAT3 function, which is all integrin function, just in those somatic gonad cells. Okay, so adding on to this, this model I'm building, um, in the basement membrane, it appears our current thinking is that laminin is somehow inhibiting a signal in the basement membrane that would normally activate integrin. And integrin would then be responsible for um, activation eventually of notch in the primordial germ cells through a mechanism we don't yet understand. Okay, so what is that potential other protein in the basement membrane that laminin could be inhibiting? So we took a look at the other core basement membrane components, and one that I'll, I want to tell you about today is called perlican. Um, in worms, this is the uh, UNC52 protein, and this is a very large heparin sulfate proteoglycan that sits in all basement membranes. But interestingly, um, it can do two things, at least. It has RGD motifs, which it can use to interact directly with integrins. And it also can bind numerous different signaling proteins. So it could, you could imagine this protein working in many different ways to potentially um, signal to the somatic gonad cells. And here it is, uh, this is a bit dim, but you can see it on sitting on the outside surface here of the, of the gonad in this L1 animal. Okay, so here is the schematic of UNC52. We took advantage of two different mutations in, in this uh, that affect the protein. One is an early stop codon, which is probably a very strong loss of function or a null here in, the, in this, this third domain, conserved domain. And uh, this mutation very specifically deletes the RGD, one of the two RGDs in this protein um, that are known to inter interact with integrin. And with either one of these two mutations, um, uh, both of them suppress the phenotype, that, uh, the supernumerary PGC phenotype caused by laminin depletion, including the RGD deletion, which doesn't affect production of the protein, um, suggesting that maybe that interaction with integrin is important. That we, we don't yet know. Okay, so tacking onto this model, just to summarize what I've told you so far, um, the SGPs are nucleating a basement membrane. One of the key components is laminin. Laminin um, maintains the shape of the organ in part by uh, through dystroglycan interactions. And it also, at least genetically, uh, through a mechanism we don't yet understand, appears to be inhibiting uh, perlican or something that's perlican dependent. And perlican or some effector of perlican is signaling through integrin uh, to the SGPs to activate um, the notch pathway downstream in the PGCs. So the questions that we're really pursuing now that, that this model raises 
or what is Perlican doing? Is it directly activating integrin or is it functioning through some of the many different signaling proteins that it is known to interact with? Um, and also how does integrin signaling lead to notch activation? My favorite hypothesis, which will probably then be wrong, is that the integrin signaling is turning on a notch ligand in the SGPs and that is what's activating the notch receptor in uh, the PGCs. Okay, before I move to the second part of uh, my talk, are there any questions about this first part where you can wait to the end if you have them? Okay, moving on. All right, so that was one cell interaction. So all of that was just interaction between the somatic gonad cells and the germ and the primordial germ cells. So now I'm going to introduce interactions that these cells make with another cell type, which is actually not part of this organ. In uh, eventually, but it does it is part of the organ, at least during development, and that is the endoderm. So you can see, just to remind you, that the primordial germ cells, about halfway through embryogenesis, they make they undergo this shape change. I'm happy to talk about this. I didn't include it as part of this talk. Um, they make these lobes that then begin to bifurcate. They look like Mickey Mouse ears, and those are are wrapped up by the uh, endodermal cells. And again, this is the same micrograph from John Salston. You can see that those lobes here. Okay, so some years ago, uh, we made a really surprising discovery. So these, these lobes that the germ cells made were first seen, and to my knowledge, almost only seen by John Salston, who was really, he, I don't think anything got by that guy, um, and including the whole lineage. And so he, he saw these lobes and he noticed that they disappeared. They weren't present in when the animals hatched, but he saw them just by DIC microscopy in the embryo. And a rotation student I had in my lab at the time, Yusuf Abdu, noticed that when he expressed an SG, a PGC specific marker, and this is the magenta marker, that in L1s, when he looked at them, there were pieces of those PGCs inside the intestine. And when he ablated the endoderm genetically, he saw that the cells, these are the two primordial germ cells. So this is that debris I just mentioned inside the intestine. The cells still made these lobes, but they didn't, nothing happened to them. They were still stuck to the surface. And so we thought at that time that they were either disappearing, they were sloughing them off and the endoderm was consuming them through phagocytosis or maybe something more sinister, like this, the endoderm was cannibalizing those pieces by biting them off of the primordial germ cells. So he really showed that the, the latter was the case by taking those animals which didn't have endoderm and then photo bleaching all those lobes. And you can see that they very rapidly recover indicating that they're still connected. So they're not releasing them and then they're being phagocytosed. And in a complementary experiment, he loaded the embryo with a caged rhodamine dextran that didn't fluoresce until he hit it with a laser and then activated it in one of the two cells. And you can see when he does that, that it diffuses really quickly through those lobes into the other cell. So when you don't have endoderm, the cells, they can make lobes all by themselves, but they remain attached. And he went on, I'm not gonna talk about this since it's kind of an old paper, but he identified a genetic pathway that those the endoderm cells used to actually physically cut off and bite the, the lobes off and then they become digested. But um, despite how that happens, um, you might be wondering, why would you do this? Why would you bother making this large structure, it's about half the volume of the cell, only to have it consumed by another cell and cannibalized and destroyed. And so we began to look at components of the lobes, thinking that maybe they were functioning like trash cans. Maybe the primordial germ cells had stuff that they inherited from um, the oocyte eventually through reductive divisions, and they wanted to get rid of it. And one of the things that we had focused on, because virtually all of them at one stage are present in these lobes are mitochondria. So here in this time-lapse image, you can see one of the two PGCs here, and these mitochondria are just the mitochondria inside the PGC, and this top portion is the lobe, and you can see that almost all of them move into that structure. Um, so we began to look at those uh, mitochondria and wonder if this process of cannibalism somehow affected their transmission in the germline to the next generation and, and the properties of those. And this was the project of grad student Aaron Schwartz, and who's still in the lab. And he, he wondered, could somehow this cannibalism be involved in regulating the inheritance of mitochondria in the germline? Okay, so let me just show you some still pictures of what mitochondria look like at, through a couple of key time points during the stage. This is right when lobes are beginning to form. You can see, here's the nucleus. They're kind of distributed all over. As soon as the lobe forms, they're all up inside there. 
Some appear to migrate back. We haven't we haven't looked at this carefully with time lapse imaging, but they're stretched out like like a subset is migrating back into the cell body, and then um, as I'll show you in a minute, some end up in the lobes and are digested. And so this population of mitochondria here is going to be the these are the mitochondria that found the entire population of mitochondria in the germline, and therefore a subset of those are the ones that go on to the next generation. Okay, so the first thing he wanted to know is what actually happens to the PGC mitochondria. Do they, are they consumed? Do they pop out inside the endoderm and have some function? And to address this question, he labeled the mitochondria with two different fluorescent proteins that have differential pH sensitivity. And so the idea here is that if they're being degraded, they're certainly acidified in the lysosome, and that would quench the fluorescence of this dendra fluorescent protein, which has a high pKa. And the M cherry label would not be quenched because that should still fluoresce inside the lysosome. And so indeed what he saw is if you look at the mitochondria in the cell body, they express both of these markers, but these are the mitochondria inside the endoderm and you can see they express the cherry protein and um, not the dendra so that that's being quenched. So this was really consistent with as soon as the lobes are cut off, they have lots of mitochondria and those are being degraded inside the endoderm cells. Okay, so how does this affect uh, germline mitochondrial inheritance. All right, so let me let me introduce to you uh, the mitochondrial genome um, first. So this is uh, so every mitochondrion has one or multiple mitochondrial genomes called mtDNAs, and in C. elegans, like in many animals, um, these contain genes involved in protein encoding genes involved in oxidative phosphorylation. So there are about um, twelve genes in C. elegans on the mitochondrial uh, genome. Again, and these genomes are present in multiple copy uh, per mitochondrion. Uh, so how are they inherited in the germline? So in C. elegans, like in many different animals, they come just from the mother. So they're actually mitochondria in the sperm, but right after fertilization, they're targeted and destroyed. So uh, the inheritance comes from the oocyte. Um, and the primordial germ cells inherit only a small fraction of the mitochondrial DNAs that the mother inherits. So the oocyte contains many, you have a bunch of reductive divisions to make the primordial germ cells, and that is the set that's gonna go on to make uh, the next generation. Okay, but here's the problem. So mitochondrial DNA is very easily mutated and very, uh, it's not very efficiently fixed. And so uh, what's keeping these mutations at bay? Uh, they're not often, it's not often that you see deleterious mitochondrial mutations passed on from generation to generation. There are plenty of examples, but it's not nearly as common as you would predict um, theoretically. And so a mutation that destroys one of these essential oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation genes in the mitochondrial genome can be balanced or complemented by the wild type copy from uh, a genome in the same mitochondrion. And this is a, a situation called heteroplasmy. So you can actually have a really defective mitochondrial genome that can persist because it's being complemented by the wild type copy. And for reasons that uh, are a pretty amazing discovery by, by several labs in C. elegans is that um, there are mutant DNAs that can actually have a selfish advantage uh, over time. And I'll, I'll actually introduce one of these in a minute um, so we can actually study the, the role of mutant DNAs. But for now, I'm just gonna talk about wild type DNAs um, so how does the germline deal with this problem? You have mitochondria that can accumulate mutations, but they don't seem to do so at the rate that you would predict. So there are um, two uh, theories about how this can happen, and these are not mutually exclusive. The first is a little more abstract, uh, and it's stochastic, and that's called a bottleneck. So imagine in this metaphor, you have, here's your oocyte, and the blue marbles are good mitochondrial genomes, and you have a small number of bad ones, which are the yellow ones. If just by chance you pull out a very small number of those marbles, and those are your primordial germ cells, then some are gonna have a different burden of, of bad genomes to good genomes versus other primordial germ cells. So this would create a situation where now you could have natural selection acting on those germ cells, or uh, even in the next generation on, on the fitness of the organism that they give rise to. Okay, so in mammals, uh, the bottleneck occurs. It's still theoretical as to the effect of this on, on inheritance of mitochondria, but it occurs because the maternal um, mitochondrial DNAs that are put into the oocyte are not replicated before the primordial germ cells are born. So you have you subdivide them and subdivide them and they inherit, depending on which paper you look at, 
dozens to about 200. Um, and the same is true in, in mouse. So a small number of mitochondrial genomes uh, per primordial germ cell. And that is, that is thought to be the genetic bottleneck um, that during germline development. So Aaron wondered, um, could this cannibalism be a totally different novel mechanism for achieving the same end of getting rid of an extra burden of mitochondrial DNA so that you reach some nadir that was important for development? And so the first way he addressed this question was just to look um, directly at or indirectly at the mitochondrial genomes instead of just at the whole mitochondria. And he began to do this by tagging a protein called TFAM. And this, you can think of this as the histone of mitochondrial DNA. So it's, it, they form these little puncta. Uh, depending on the paper you read, they have one to at most a few mitochondrial genomes associated with each punctum in mammalian cells, at least. Um, and our data is consistent with that. Um, and so he used CRISPR to endogenously tag TFAM. And you can see here are the two PGCs. It's labeled in all cells. But if you focus on the ones here, you see these individual foci. So those contain uh, mitochondrial genomes. And this is, this is how they're distributed. So the nuclei are, are here, which is why they're, they're being excluded there. OK, so and you can see those actually that, that the fragments of mitochondria that are, have just been eaten in this embryo contain those dots. So there is DNA in those mitochondria that are getting consumed. So they are losing some amount of DNA. So he started off but to address this question just by counting the foci in uh, embryonic primordial germ cells before the lobes were cannibalized and then looking in larvae after they had been cannibalized. And you can even just by looking at these pictures, you can tell that there's a, a, a big difference. And he saw that um, more than twofold, uh, you had a more than twofold reduction in the number of foci. Of course, you might, you might uh, argue, well, we don't know how many are on each of those foci and their concentration could change. So this was just a suggestion that they were losing DNAs. And so to address this, Aaron really, uh, he worked hard to develop um, what, uh, what turned out to be a very clean method of sorting individual germ cells uh, to actually count using droplet digital PCR, the number of genomes. And later I'll tell you, we can genotype those as well. So the key to this um, sorting process was to sort against those cells that wrap around the primordial germ cells because they really stick to them, as you might have guessed based on what I've already told you. So he did this with two colors, sorting four germ cells and against the somatic cells. And then he was able to purify the cells and then use droplet digital PCR. He did this on two populations and the embryo, those cells, as I'll show you on the next slide, had not yet undergone lobe formation or lobe cannibalism. And in the L1 larva, they had. And so here's some examples of the cells that he sorted. You can see the embryonic PGCs are bigger. That's because they haven't lost all that cytoplasm to cannibalism. And there's almost a non-overlapping distribution here. So these have lobes and these, these do not. And they were almost completely pure only after he sorted against this other population. Okay, so, uh, so he, re he asked the same question I just, uh, we, we looked at visually. And that was how many mitochondrial genomes does each of those cells have at um, these two developmental points? And consistent with his imaging data, he saw about a twofold reduction between about 400 mitochondrial genomes per PGC in the embryo and about 200. And this number is actually remarkably similar to the mammalian PGC numbers of a, a couple of hundred in per primordial germ cell, again, depending on which paper um, you look at. Okay, so uh, he wanted to know, is this difference between these two time points a result of the cannibalism of those lobes? Um, and so for this, we took advantage of a study from a former grad student in my lab, Chelsea Maniscalco, who wondered how lobes formed in the first place. And I won't, I won't talk about this. I'm happy to answer questions about it. But she showed that there was a non-mitotic contractile ring, which formed in the middle of the cell and squeezed it like a corset. And that's what created the lobes. And the key components, so here's the ring. Actually, this is myosin sitting in that, that ring. It squeezes down, but not all the way, like a cytokinetic ring. And the key activator she found of this process was a protein called NOP1, which was required for activating NMY2. And therefore, in a NOP1 mutant, uh, you formed very few to no lobes. And so Aaron uh, took advantage of NOP1. It's a viable mutation because it seems to be very specific in which uh, stages of development it regulates myosin. And he saw that unlike this sharp drop he gets between the embryo and the L1, uh, in wild type, he sees a non-significant uh, change in the NOP1. Okay, so the cannibalism is creating this bottleneck, at least uh, at this stage um, of development. 
And we, he went one step further to ask, was this the real bottleneck or you might imagine if the cells are not replicating their genomes as they begin to divide in the L1, that they might drop even further. So for this experiment, he took L1 animals and uh, fed them for different periods of time and then counted the genomes. And if they were replicating, you would predict that the number of mtDNAs per germline would begin to grow at this stage. If they were not, it would continue to drop. And so that was his experiment. And you can see here is mtDNAs per germline at successive developmental stages. And you can see that there's a rapid increase in the number of genomes. But remarkably, this reduction that happens between the embryo and the L1 is absolutely maintained uh, during larval stages. So the number 200 uh, appears to be a sweet spot that those cells like to maintain. Uh, like to maintain. And we don't yet know the, the biological significance of that drop, but we do know that it's important from the experiment that I'm gonna tell you about next. And that is, he asked what would happen in a NOP1 mutant where you didn't have the cannibalism and they inherited twice as many mitochondrial genomes as they should have. Um, and he saw uh, that remarkably after, even a, after about one to two cell cycles, they used some other mechanism to adjust the number of mtDNAs to reach the same set point of 200. So they have multiple ways of achieving 200. The normal way is to get rid of half of them by cannibalism through the endoderm. If that doesn't happen in this mutant background, then they sense that that's a problem and they adjust probably through replication and, and they reach 200 a different way. Okay. All right. So the second mechanism and what I'll end um, my talk about uh, talking about is everything I've told you is just wild type genomes. Is there some bias against mutant genomes? And you might imagine that being a good thing. Like if the PGCs had a high mutational load of mtDNAs, maybe those are the mitochondria that are going to preferentially end up in the lobes. And so this is a process called purifying selection. And you can imagine how this might work. Like if a mitochondrion had a really high a uh, mutational burden of mtDNA it wouldn't work as effectively, and that could be recognized by various um, cellular pathways, which I'll introduce, and those mitochondria could be moved to different parts of the cell or destroyed, for example. So that's purifying selection, and this, is, this has been shown, um, particularly in Drosophila, a couple of nice models to be involved in germline selection of mitochondrial genomes. So for this experiment, Aaron took advantage of this really well-characterized um, mutant genome in C. elegans, uh, mutant mitochondrial genome called UADIF5. So this is a mitochondrial genome that's missing 3.1 kilobases of DNA, including several essential genes for oxidative phosphorylation. So it has to be complemented by wild type, and it has to persist in heteroplasmy. But remarkably, it's selfish, and several labs have shown that um, it has a selfish advantage in replication, so it persists over many generations, despite the fact that it's not doing anything good that we know of for the animal. So he, for that reason, he can use this strain and do ex experiments and ask, well, what would happen um, uh, to, this, to this genome? Importantly, the data that I just showed you suggested that there's little to no replication of those genomes that's happening until he puts the larvae down on food. So probably there's no replication happening and this selfish behavior of UADIF5 is probably not occurring in the primordial germ cells. Okay, so is there a purifying selection during this cannibalism process? So the first thing he did was just to use the same sorting assay and the droplet digital PCR to look at different time points. And he sees that UADIF5 is present um, at about 50% heteroplasmy with wild type in the whole embryo. The, the PGCs in the embryo have about the same level of heteroplasmy. And then that drops. It drops about 5%. Um, and so it's still present, but it, this is a very reproducible drop. And it, as soon as the animals start feeding again in the L1, it goes up again. So that's probably due to that selfish uh, replication that I just told you about, although we, we haven't tested that. Okay, so there is a drop that's happening between the embryo and the L1, which means that somehow... UA diff 5 genomes are being preferentially lost during that stage. And we don't think this is due to replication because we have no evidence that it's happening at that point. So is that because of the cannibalism? So again, returning to the NOP1 mutants, we asked, does this, does this drop happen in NOP1? And um, to Aaron's great surprise and initial dismay, it did. So he saw exactly the same drop when he didn't have cannibalism that he saw in wild type. So between the embryo and the L1. And another way of showing the same data is just the percentage drop 
uh, between embryo and L1. So this would be zero change. And you can see both of these are dropping about four to five percent in this, this time frame. Okay, so there is purifying selection, but it doesn't require the cannibalism that I've told you about. So what's going on? So Aaron began to test other pathways, which might be functioning in parallel with this cannibalism pathway that's occurring at the same time. And one well-known way to get rid of mitochondria is through a process called autophagy. Um, and this is where um, organelles can be um, engulfed in a membranous structure and targeted to the lysosome through a very well um, characterized and understood pathway. Um, and the first thing that he did to ask whether this might ha be happening during this stage of development was to use the same pH sensitive mitochondrial markers I already introduced to you and ask, was there evidence of a population of mitochondria in the PGCs that were acidified, suggesting that they were being degraded in the lysosome? And he saw in about half of the PGCs a very bright focus that was not expressing his pH sensitive marker, but was expressing the pH insensitive marker. And when he blocked autophagy through a mutant, I'll introduce to you in a second, he never saw this. So this, this appears to be the result of an autophagy event that's happening in those primordial germ cells in many cases. Could that be responsible for this reduction in the mutant genomes? So uh, this is a very busy slide, but I just put it up to introduce to you where in the pathway we're gonna be blocking it. So we looked at one gene involved in initiation called ATG13, another involved in elongation of the membrane that surrounds the mitochondria called ATG18, and a third gene that is an adapter protein that links mitochondria to the autophagosomal membrane called DCT1 or BNIP and other species. And in all of those genetic backgrounds, Aaron still saw this drop that happened during PGCs. So this was another surprise. And he was beginning to get quite desperate at this point and turned to the last pathway, which I'll tell you about. Um, so there is hope. And this is a, this is a pathway uh, that utilizes a kinase called PINK1 and in many cases, uh, a protein that interacts with called Parkin. And so PINK1 is a kinase, and when a mitochondrion is healthy, it's destroyed. But when a mitochondrion is unhealthy because it's not producing um, uh, the proper uh, proton gradient, then it's actually stabilized on the surface of the mitochondria where it can phosphorylate proteins. And one of those is an E3 ubiquitin ligase called Parkin. And Parkin can then target that mitochondrion for degradation. So usually that happens through autophagy, but there are also a couple of examples where um, PINK1 and PARKIN can function independently of autophagy, which is why this pathway caught our attention. So one is the production of vesicles that bud off of mitochondria, and you can imagine that might be one way to get rid of, of genomes. And another is the direct fusion of um, targeted mitochondria with endosomes, which go on to become lysosomes that totally bypasses the autophagy pathway. So this pathway can work independently of autophagy. So finally, a positive result. Um, Aaron was able to show that in PINK1 mutants, he totally blocked this, uh, this reduction between embryo and L1. Surprisingly, in the Parkin mutants, there was no effect whatsoever. And in the double mutants, it looked just like the PINK1 by itself. So this experiment told us that PINK1 was involved in parallel to the cannibalism. There's a surveillance pathway, which is recognizing mitochondria that have higher burdens of uh, the UA diff 5 genome. We don't yet know how it's reducing the number of those genomes. That's, that's something we're quite interested in and helping to eliminate, eliminate those at this very foundational stage of the germline when the mitochondrial population is being set to go on to replicate and be placed into gametes in the next generation. Okay, so just to sum up what I told you in the second half, um, We've shown that the cannibalism, this interaction between the primordial germ cells and the endoderm cells is important for setting the number of mitochondrial genomes. And it sets it to a number that's similar um, in different species. It appears to be important because we can knock that number off and it comes back and it eliminates about half of the mitochondrial genomes, but it does so stochastically. So there, at least with respect to UADF5, there's no selection for or against it at this stage. At the same time, there's a surveillance pathway which uses purifying selection and the kinase PINK1 to preferentially inhibit the mutant genomes uh, during the same stage so that when the animal hatches, it has a lower burden of those mutational genomes uh, for its germline than, does, than it would have uh, before. Okay, so with that, um, I acknowledge the folks along the way. So everything I told you about was the work of two really fantastic people in the lab. So Dan, again, was a postdoc who worked on the basement membrane and the SGPs. Um, and Aaron is a graduate student who, who did the second 
project that I told you about. And he started that project in collaboration with Malik Patel and Nikita Saiba at Vanderbilt, who showed him how to do the, um, the droplet digital PCR uh, at the initial stages of this. And I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, these funding sources also for the work. And thank you so much. I'd be glad to take any questions. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I have a question that really on in there about the um the SPC migration to see if it's a use of base membrane. Uh I found it really cool that like they sort of seem to overshoot or like cluster together nearby the PVCs uh, when we lose the base base of membrane components. They don't go to a different place, they don't fail to migrate, they don't like get close but not make it. They seem to, you know, like magnets, and get attracted to each other instead. And I was wondering if you had any like insight into what what drives that, or kind of uh, how that plays. Into yeah. The story. That's a really interesting question. And there, there was a, a study that we did some time ago where it wasn't very mechanistic, but we asked those types of questions. We did live imaging on, on embryos that were missing laminin. And you're absolutely right. What happens uh, is that SGPs actually overshoot the germ cells, but then they come back. So I think that the normal role, there is a role for laminin in the migration that they can, they can get around, but it seems to like really refine where they stop. But in that same study, we did things like ablate the germ cells and the, the SGPs move to about the right region and they start feeling around like there's supposed to be a cell there and they can't find one. So there, I think there are lots of different signals from, from broad uh, regional signals to very fine local signals that, that guide that wrapping behavior. But molecularly speaking, we don't know uh, how that might happen with the basement membrane at that point. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is really about if laminin, maybe laminin is involved in templating perlican. If that's true, how can the genetics that I told you about be right? So we've actually looked at that question. When you get rid of laminin, there's still perlican around the base of membrane. So I, this model that laminin is the super foundation upon which everything is built, I think is very simplistic. The, the broader question of how laminin might be from a molecular perspective inhibiting perlican, we don't know the answer to that. I mean, you could imagine different ways like potentially access to integrin. There could be some kind of conformational change that that interaction may be involved in. It may affect the signaling proteins that perlican binds. Those are really great questions and that's, that's really where we're going next with that angle of the project. Yeah. Uh, I was curious what you think is the role of the uh, animalized, the mitochondrial animals in this, if there's a redundant way to reduce the numbers further downstream. And there's also a different mechanism for uh, serotonin selection to the same point in time. Yeah, so the, 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 there's definitely redundancy, and, and, and we can have quite, quite a discussion about the importance of redundancy in various developmental events. Um, so yes, they do have a way to get around the cannibalism, at least with respect to mitochondria. There's other stuff in the lobes besides mitochondria. So one argument may be that a trash can has lots of trash of different types. And I told you about one piece of it. And so there, there probably is a lot that we're missing um, that we haven't yet looked at for there could be RNAs that are being destroyed that are important for later events. Um, it is really interesting though, that they, they really don't like having too many. That was actually quite a disappointment because we thought we'd be able to use that NOP1 mutant to test this bottleneck hypothesis. But right away, they, they go, okay, I have too many and I'm going to reset to, to 200. So uh, the hand wavy argument is, yes, there's redundancy. They don't like having too many. That is a sweet spot. We don't yet know the importance of it, whether that's functioning really at a genetic level as a bottleneck, because we haven't, we can't test that now with the NOP1 phenotype. But that's the way that we're thinking about that process. 
Yeah, we don't know. We've we've tried to tag pink one to look and see if it has some kind of asymmetric distribution, and we can't see it. So it's it's present at a really low level. Um, so that's something we we'd like to know whether there's some kind of kind of asymmetry. You would think if it happened in the lobe that that wouldn't really fit so much with the with the data that we have uh, showing that when you block there, there's cannibalism has no effect on the localization of I mean I'm sorry on the percentage of UA to five. But it could be that there are compartments within the permeable germ cell that, that have spatial asymmetry. Yeah. Valerie, yeah. Um, if that's the case, then why does it look like all mitochondria go there and then a few get spit back into the Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think there's some there's some great cell biology there. All of that is happening when the embryo is spinning around the eggshell. Daniel and I were just talking about this. It's an imaging nightmare because uh, <laughs> You have to have a really fast microscope, and then the next time point, the cells are in different positions. And so we've done a little bit of that, but it, it's slow. Um, they really look like there's a subset that are coming back. And one experiment that we did um, that we haven't published is we, it looks like early on, all those mitochondria are connected together. Because if you photo convert a matrix protein, it immediately goes to all the rest of the mitochondria. But then there appears to be a subset that become physically isolated by that assay right before they, they come back and right before the lobes get cannibalized. So I don't know why that is, but one possibility is that this non-mitotic contractile ring that's right there at that neck is somehow signaling to the mitochondria to cause them to separate and a subset to migrate back. That's, that's a really interesting question and we, we don't yet know the answer to it. Yes, Mark. If you, if you, you have your fine selection, so yeah the, that's a great question that's kind of where Aaron's going next with this and so what we, we what I didn't tell you about is this the pink one pathway and and some other components that don't have a role in PGCs probably do have a role in purifying selection in the larval gonad and the adult so this is not the only stage of development where you have selection, but that is counterbalanced by this, selected, this selective advantage of replication that the mutant genome has in the larval stages. So what we really would like to do, and this is something that he's working on, is, is figure out a way to inhibit pink one just in the PGCs and then grow those animals over generations and see does the mutational burden change or the profile change in those animals. And we, we don't know yet, but that's a, that's a really great thought. Yes. I'm wondering about this is in a deal of actually the sensor that, that is part of the frenzy. Um, you know, we see a five percent difference in the uh in, in, in the percentage of genomes. How does that translate in terms of heterotopy within even mitochondria? Yeah, uh, what, what's the percentage within a mitochondria that needs to be screwed up for this mitochondria to be recognized? Great question. Right. So you, I, I actually, the, you know, you think about the difference, so it seems like quite a small difference, but then you also think about the problem, right? If you have 50-50 distribution of wild type and mutant genomes and mitochondria have multiple genomes, you probably have to be at the far end of the spectrum. Like maybe you have all bad mitochondrial genomes or almost all bad mitochondrial genomes to even be recognized in the first place. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a small difference there. We don't have the resolution to ask that question at the time being. We're, we're working on tools to do that with a collaborator where we can we could go in hopefully using live imaging and visualize the distribution of mutant genomes and wild type genomes. I don't know if we'll have the resolution to do that in individual mitochondria, that, 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 but that's, that's actually, that's a really important question to know at that level what's happening. Daniel. So I was wondering a little bit about the mechanisms that you were describing. So, we, so autophagy you have a phenotype of the, the, the pink one, the, the, the lysosomal biogenesis pathways or, or acidification pathways, you know, copy the, the, the pink one. And along those lines, uh, you know, Monica Mishko is seeing this like- um, Yeah, the exophers, yeah. Seen anything like that? Yeah, we haven't. The, to, to answer your first question, we, we looked at that, we looked at the pH sensitive mitochondrial markers in the pink one mutant and there was no, it didn't affect that. So there is autophagy happening at the stage. It is not selective for the mutant versus the wild type genomes. And we don't yet know 
what's downstream in pink one? We just know what's not. So it's not working through autophagy. It's not working through parking. It's not working through this adapter DCT1, which has been shown in other systems to, to be important. So that's we, still an open question. Um, yeah, so I, 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 don't, I don't have anything further than that to, to answer that question. So the, the downsizing of the germ cells that happen is low. Um, do you think that there are other roles of the that get integrated to optimize the bundle? For example, I mean, you must have tons of cytoplasm, RNAs, uh, maybe even transcription factors, and, and whether this might be related to the biasing state of the cell. That's a, that's a great question. So, yeah, so uh, certainly there's more in there. And we have, we have done kind of a broad survey. There are things like yolk granules. We know actually these... Um, uh, Paranuclear structures called P granules, which are important in the germline. Some of them actually get appears to like slough off of the nucleus and go into the lobe. I I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we think that this is all they're doing, um, but and, and I think you're probably right. There there are other things in there that are important, maybe even in very subtle ways for the biology of the germ cells. We don't yet know. We haven't done an exhaustive survey. I really like the idea that there could be some RNAs which are asymmetrically localized and trash. There's evidence of that in other systems that the RNAs can be you know, asymmetrically distributed through division at least. And so that would be a really attractive mechanism. So the, the mitochondrial bottleneck happens across many species and maybe I missed this, um, but is it known whether there is a morphological system in other species where there is a similar problem for mitochondrial bottleneck? Uh, that I have nev never seen described in, 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 in us and in other mammals. It happens through reductive division of the mtDNAs are placed in the oocyte. So they're not replicated until you make primordial germ cells. So they just get subdivided and then they start replication. So it, that's kind of a passive process. Whereas here, actually both things are happening here. We, sh we don't see any evidence of replication and then you, you take half of them away and you digest them to, to achieve that final number. Knock activation by basement membrane, loss of basement membrane. Right. I mean, not just a usually through cell 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 connection. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know. <laughs> we think that there is. We don't. Yeah. Okay. We'll okay, see, Antonio. You, Antonio. Um, there is. There has to be a ligand that 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 the SGPs express, and there are like twenty candidates in worms, and we've started to look at this. Yeah. Okay, but like they should be usually what on the basolateral.